I'm normally a screamer, I'm normally passionate, but shit, what do I do now? After I... <laughs> so I'm just going to kind of calm it down, have a meditative stance, tell you a little bit about my day. Um, I started early in the morning, and I used all of the available technology that is in our hands, okay, to transform our lives to get here. Right? I went into my car, uh, I took my old $500 iPhone, uh, and, uh, and connected it on my, in my car with my thumb, which I thought was substantially more useful than my face. But nonetheless, we'll find out, OK? Uh, and I went to Waze. And then I said, well, where are you going? And I said, well, I know where I'm going. It's where I've gone every year, every time I've done this, and where I used to go all the time. I used to live in Providence and went to Brown. I'm going to Trinity Square. Yeah, only the Providence people know how this story ends, right? So I plug in Trinity Square, it says fine, it says you're 46 miles away, so that's kind of right, and, you know, and, and everything is gonna be fine, and I'm driving, and I'm learning all sorts of incredibly useful things this morning. Where the cops are hiding? It's pretty cool, I never found one. Okay, so they really hide very well. Today, only on the road from Boston to Providence, does there appear to be an overabundance of roadkill? <laughs> and now they actually warn you. Right? So instead of looking to my right, to my left, in front of me and behind me, shit, I'm out there looking for roadkill. <laughs> right? Just a whole portfolio of useless information all day long, right? I get to Providence, it tells me to take off 95 on Atwell's Avenue. That kind of seems right. Okay. And then it starts directing me on all these side streets and announces, after I got lost once, you are here. <laughs> and I look around, I pull over, and I say, shit, they're masquerading the theater. <laughs> Just like the cops, the theater is hiding. <laughs> and I suddenly discover that 42 years later, from the time I left Providence Fundamentally, the name of this theater has changed from the Trinity Square Repertory the Company to the Trinity Rep. Now, how am I supposed to know this? And how am I supposed to know? Thank God I got lost in Providence. Because you get lost in Providence, there's only five minutes to where you're going. <laughs> but the metaphor of using technology to transform your life in some fundamental way, only to discover a whole portfolio of consequences that you hadn't expected, is what I want to talk about here today. I'm today, as, as Saul said, I'm back at the Harvard Business School. I started there 42 years ago uh, as a young, struggling academic. Now I have this marvelous label of a post-tenure professor. That means all sorts of shit comes out of your mouth. <laughs> and it's really fun, right? And you can teach whatever you want to teach. Uh, and you can do whatever you want to do. And most of the time, I spend time trying to think about uh, how we can tackle obvious situations uh, empirically to actually drive positive action. The first time I had the opportunity to do that was almost 30 years ago. I had one of the most profound learning experiences I ever had. I got to be involved in the process of redesigning Taco Bell. I mean, it is a burning academic question. It is something that all of you should have committed your lives to. As part of that process, we tried to figure out who was going to Taco Bell. Taco Bell was offering their food basically for 59, 79, and 99 cents. So the first research question was answered pretty obviously. The core customer was what we affectionately called a penny-pinching hoo-foo, or a thrift-oriented, high-frequency fast food user. 12 or more meal occasions a week, reasonably easy to spot. The only problem with this model, having developed this 59, 79, 99 cent menu, is you couldn't make money selling tacos for 59 cents. Just couldn't do it. 
So the question is, how can we redesign the system to be able to deliver profitability in this environment? Well, what you need to do is find out who these who foods are and what they want. So we did all of this very sophisticated conjoint analysis. In the old days, when you did research, you actually talked to people. <laughs> and we asked them, and we found out what they wanted. Customers wanted fact. Fast food, fast orders, accurate in a clean environment at the right temperature. Hot food, hot, cold food, cold. We presented this to management. They were deeply offended. No one's talked about the food. I said, that's not true. They said hot food, hot, cold food, cold. <laughs> For 59 cents, what kind of conversation are you going to have about the food? <laughs> I mean, it's just patently absurd that people can get completely invested in an ideology and mindset of delivering extraordinary food-oriented value to customers. So we had to redesign the system to deliver fact. And all we had to do was turn the entire system uh, upside down, completely upside down, had extraordinary results in being able to do it. All you had to do was take the kitchens out of the restaurants. Well, why would you take the kitchens out of the restaurants? Well, it's not about the food. You can prepare all this food off-site. And you can turn the kitchen into a re-thermalization unit. <laughs> and there are about 20 other things that we were able to do with technology and with people that really made a huge difference. Fundamentally gave them aspirations of being able to sell tacos everywhere. Within two years, we were talking about taco ubiquity. <laughs> Close your eyes, reach out. And within an arm's reach, there'll be a taco. <laughs> now, the question is, what academic utility does this have at all? Okay? Uh, and the answer is quite a bit. We were able to take this work at Taco Bell and actually build an intellectual framework called the service profit chain um, that articulated a bunch of very, very straightforward notions. We began to understand the underlying economics of customer loyalty and how it led to profitability and growth. And we began to understand the ways in which employees were actually motivated and inspired to deliver for customers. It allowed us, after several years, to publish a number of things where we were able to stand up and say, the key to success in life and service organizations is very simple. Find out who your customers are. Find out what they want. Give it to them. <laughs> And then I got tenure. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I still remember the president of the university at that time saying, oh, yeah, you're the Taco Bell guy. <laughs> he was a poet. He just didn't understand the love and the insight that could be developed from a chalupa. And we started doing more and more research in a variety of different service-related settings to understand all of these things and to refine the underlying logic and I'm actually pleased to say, just a couple of months ago, I got to speak at a, a service research conference and discovered this poor guy from Germany who had spent the last six years of his life doing the first large-scale meta-analysis of every piece of research done to actually extend the logic of the service profit chain. And thankfully, his conclusion was, it appears to be right. just amazing that someone would spend six years of his life for a set of ideas that we kicked around one afternoon and then felt strong enough, enough to write. So I've taken those ideas and I played in education. It's great. I played in retail. It was just absolutely super. And a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to talk about the experience of being a caregiver for my mother. Uh, and how frustrating that was uh, for me, okay? Concluding that even though I had resigned from a college presidency to free up time and capability to be able to take care of her, uh, it was 30 to 35 hours a week. It was the hardest job of my life, okay? And the only thing I could conclude is healthcare didn't know who the customer was, actually, in many cases, could care less. Okay? Doesn't know what they want, and certainly doesn't give it to them. 
I mean, don't know who their customer is, don't really know what they want, and clearly doesn't give it to them. And so one of the nice things about having been around for a long time is I've taught lots and lots of students. So I'll say I've had generations of students. Inevitably, given that I teach somewhere in the neighborhood of 185 at a time, just the law of averages at the Harvard Business School say a disproportionately large number of them are about to do something interesting. And all I can do is attach myself to the alumni records and seeing who's doing interesting things. And I lucked out. Um, the biggest company between my office and my home is Athena Healthcare. And a number of the senior leaders at Athena Healthcare uh, were students of mine 25 and 30 years ago. So we began to talk about the service profit chain and said, so well, does this have any application whatsoever in healthcare? And the answer is, I'd sure love to find out. The vast majority of people I talked to in healthcare said, eh, I don't think this is gonna apply. You just don't understand healthcare. I also was told I just didn't understand retail. I just didn't understand higher education. I just didn't understand Taco Bell. <laughs> well, let's give it a try, okay? Let's see if we can understand it. So we began to take the service profit chain logic, as complex as it was, and began to modify it in a variety of different ways to account for the complexity of outcomes that exist in healthcare, okay? We want to have clinical outcomes as well as financial outcomes. Uh, the issues associated with the technology that is purported to bind the system together. And then finally, uh, the impact of the regulatory environment and the insurers. And come up with, in essence, what we call the high-performing physician network. And lo and behold, as we started running data out of the Athena client database, <sighs> amazingly, these relationships held. And we got a bunch of different insights not to talk about here today, except for one that I want to talk about. After we did the Taco Bell work and we started talking about the limitations employee satisfaction data, we began to hypothesize a notion that maybe it's not just employee satisfaction. Maybe there's a better way of explaining uh, what drives employee behavior. And so we started interviewing employees around the extent to which they actually believed they were capable of serving customer needs. And lo and behold, we found when employees thought they were capable, A, customers noticed it. Now, that's kind of obvious, right? But we also discovered when they thought they were capable, they were more engaged, they had less intent to leave, they were more productive, and we could demonstrate more positive financial outcomes. Wow. What if we did this for docs? What if we asked, what if a doctor actually perceived that he or she was capable of meeting patient needs? So we've just finished a set, a proprietary study, 2,000 doctors, where we actually replicated the research that we did with a variety of other service workers 25, 30 years ago. And lo and behold, you know what we've discovered? When doctors believe they are capable of serving patients' needs, they're more engaged. There's less burnout. There's less intent to leave the employer. There's higher productivity, and it yields better financial outcomes for the healthcare organization. Wow. So we have a whole set of initiatives around trying to help doctors do a better job of being doctors. Take all the other nonsense off their plate. Let them do this. At that point, I said, wait a second. If we want doctors to be doctors, and that's the key to their success, what is it going to take to allow patients to be patients? And just as doctors have jobs, patients have jobs. Except you will not find anywhere in any of the medical literature, anywhere known to mankind, that anybody has advanced the notion other than me, that patients have jobs. And in fact, as some people have said, not only are there jobs, but they're unpaid jobs. And not only are they unpaid jobs, they're jobs that lack specificity, lack clarity, okay? And when the job isn't carried out properly, how does healthcare define them? We call them non-compliant. 
How about, I didn't know. No one told me. I don't know where to get this. No one told me I was supposed to take the drugs after another month. I'm tired of having to find my x-rays over here and carry it over here. 30% of the appointments require records transfer. Right? Not even at a minimum wage job. So one, we need to understand that healthcare needs to develop a logic that says that patients have jobs. Those jobs need to be designed, they need to be specified, and they need to be managed. And there are two basic theories that are out there today, both of which are strikingly incomplete to address the question, because neither of them fundamentally recognize the notion of a job. There are my friends, and many of you here in the room, who believe that the answer exists in technology. We'll wire them up to a Fitbit. We'll have monitors all over their body. We'll connect them to telemedicine. Someone somewhere is going to give a shit about all of this data and what to do with it. <laughs> and then we will figure out exactly how to keep people healthy. And those folks also have now gotten incredibly excited about the roles and responsibilities of what they call e-patients, patients who are equipped, who are engaged, who are empowered and who are enabled, and they have a cry, give me my damn data. Have any of you ever tried to read the damn data? <laughs> right? Have any of you actually, I mean, and my doctor now uh, actually dictates their notes. I don't even know what they're trying to say before I get to the technical dimensions of it. So we have a long way to go before we can empower these e-patients with technology, but we do need to let them into the tent, and we do need to have them play an active role in that process. That represents about 2% of the population of patients that we're talking about. Those who have deep access to technology, who understand it fully, who are able to use it in a productive way, and who have the discretionary time to play around with the dashboards that all of these data generate. Then there's the rest of the population. Folks who don't know they have jobs, they actually have other jobs, right? like paid jobs. Uh, or they don't have jobs at all, uh, who actually have chronic disease, who have language difficulties, who have socioeconomic issues. And in fact, my basic argument today is in the process of trying to use technology as a bludgeon to address the issue of patient jobs, we run the risk of exacerbating all of the inequality issues that we talk about in the United States today. That we can develop mechanisms to provide extraordinary technology-enabled healthcare for a portfolio of a limited number of people who have access and capability, and leave all the rest out. Why? Because we don't have a reimbursement strategy to get paid for taking care of them. We don't have a mechanism to engage their family in a consistent way. The doctors that I just studied on capability, the 47% of them who gave us top two box scores in terms of their sense of capability, told me that 8% of their patients could play a significant role in their own health care. 8%, if I took it the top two box so I could make it look better, 32%. Less than a third. In a world where capable doctors, by and large, do not believe that patients can play a critical role in the process, we are going to be systematic, systematically unable to design the jobs of the patients in ways that they can win. And all of the efforts that we are making and improving the healthcare system in terms of information flows and technology, run the risk, really run the risk of denying care to the vast majority of people who need it, deserve it, and can't do it on their own. Thanks so much.